wonderful world of Disney. We bring you The City Fox. San Francisco Bay, since earliest times, a setting for high adventure. Many a swashbuckling sailor is put in here. Gold seekers, 49ers, Shanghai swabbies of every stripe. But of all the roistering characters in San Francisco's long history, none was more of a surprise than the hero of the tale we would tell now. To begin with, he put into port from the wrong direction, not from the sea, but from the landward side. The plain fact is, he was anything but a sailor. Now at the upper end of San Francisco Bay in the Delta country, where pheasant and quail are plentiful and farmer's chickens sit there for the taking, there exists to this day a territory we will call fox country. Fox country is wherever you find foxes, it figures. And what have foxes to do with seagoing sailors? <laughs> well, hold on a minute. That's our tale. Now, you take foxes. Survival is an old story to them. A fox is a master of deception. And none was more clever at it than this one. A foxy old fox, wise in the ways of the hunt. On this particular morning, he had his only son and protege in tow, for this was the time for schooling. The younger fox, Rusty, if we might call him that, was untaught, eager, and willing, in about that order, with much to learn about what it took to be a fox. Rusty's problem was a simple one. He couldn't concentrate. He was easily sidetracked. As he saw it, what was a pawn for if not to stop and have a cooling drink? Meanwhile, let the old man carry on with the hunting. There was much Rusty had to learn about the tricks of his trade. But this morning, his attitude seemed to say, why hurry? We've got all the time in the world. Then something stopped him in his tracks. Rusty was fascinated. He'd never known his father to tackle anything this big. And when the old man actually tried to climb the tree, he couldn't believe his eyes. This is what you might call really putting the opponent out on a limb. In the face of this kind of desperation, the fox decided to think it over. There'd be another day, another battle on better ground. Rusty was impressed. Now he realized he might learn a thing or two from the best teacher in these parts. If he would just tag along and pay close attention, he'd master all the tricks in no time. First order, fat and sassy, and ready for the pouncing. The 
suddenly a two-way deal was about to become a three-way deal. There is nothing a couple of farm dogs love to do more than to chase a freewheeling jackrabbit. Meanwhile, the two foxes were bringing up the rear. But Father Fox had some second thoughts in this matter. What was he doing chasing some dogs who were chasing a rabbit? It didn't quite make sense. Rusty, meanwhile, had never tried to figure out if it made sense. He had one single-minded idea in his head, to catch that rabbit. And for this once, he wouldn't be sidetracked. It was the rabbit who wised up and veered off for parts unknown. Now Rusty was chasing the front end of nothing. In fact, he had become the chasee. Fortunately for Rusty, the bigger dog was a clumsy lummox, unable to call his shots with any accuracy whatever. In fact, he couldn't hit the broadside of a rowboat. And the smaller dog was no better. He used monkey see, monkey do, into the drink for the stupid reason that his stupid pal had done it. Well, at least Rusty had escaped a dastardly destruction at the hands of brigands and villains, and now was bound on a journey to who knew where. No sooner had Rusty's journey begun than he found he had company on the shore. Now the father fox followed his progress downstream, seemingly trying to think of something to do to help. Rusty could have made it ashore, except that he had never been taught to swim. Of course, all animals can swim if they have to, but Rusty was a little squeamish about getting his feet wet, and he kept putting off such a desperate remedy. Whatever plan Father might have had, if any, was spoiled when his walking space ran out. He had come to a dead end. Carried along by the current, the little boat continued on its steady course. The minutes passed and still Rusty put off trying to get to shore. His one hope was that some trick of the current would deliver him to the bank close enough to land dry footed. dragged on. The blazing sun beat down on the open boat. Rusty was getting hotter and hotter and thirstier and thirstier. He would have liked a nice shady tree, but there seemed to be none on board. Finally, he located the one spot of shade the passage offered. Not any cool glade, perhaps, but the best to be had under the circumstances.
By day's end, Rusty felt both lonely and marooned. What was to happen to him? He wished he knew. Rusty watched the moon's reflections dancing on the water. He heard distant cries in the darkness. And he wished he were anywhere but here. The dawn brought a world that seemed unreal. Now the little boat was a ghost ship carrying a ghost fox to a destiny unknown. By mid-morning, reality was back and the pangs of hunger, too. And with it all, a new predicament. Rusty studied this new development with close attention. What to do? For a moment, he thought he had found a friend. But it was only himself looking back at himself. Maybe he'd best jump overboard and swim for it, after all. Then his sharp eyes caught something moving underwater. What was that? It was a river otter. Two, in fact. He found them fascinating. Here, at least, was entertainment, if nothing else. find otters, you're apt to find fish, or the other way around. Where there are fish, there are otters, for they are expert fishermen. Oops, Rusty hadn't expected this. He never for a moment figured these buccaneers would come aboard his private yacht. But otters are forward fellows who don't stand on ceremony. When the second forward fellow came on board, Rusty realized he was outnumbered. This unnerved him a little, and now there began a game of trade ends of the boat, poop deck to four feet, and back again. Rusty trying only to keep out of the way. All this maneuvering and shifting of cargo had accomplished one good thing. It had rocked the boat free. Now the current caught it again and began to carry it along. The dividend of the otter's visit was one small fish left behind. It was a welcome bonus and the first morsel of food he'd had in two days. With every minute of this secret passage, there was something happening that Rusty was unaware of. The river was getting wider and wider. Now he'd lost almost all chance of getting ashore. Now he'd have to stake his all on the little boat, hoping it might come to a safe landing somewhere. But he hadn't the slightest notion where that might occur. Rusty, of course, couldn't know anything about geography and things like river navigation, but now he was a long way from fox country. Suddenly, he saw a fleet of ghost ships going nowhere, silent, lifeless, nothing moving except their upside-down reflections. For a country boy from the sticks, the outside world was getting stranger by the minute. 
in truth, it would get stranger yet before this was over. Suddenly, the little boat began to pick up speed. It's a fact that the tides sweeping out through the Golden Gate are among the strongest known anywhere. And so, as one of San Francisco's famous fogs drew a curtain of mystery over the scene, a small boat bearing a solitary passenger made its way unnoticed out to sea. On the bridge above, people had no time for problems other than their own. In this heavy traffic, they were intent only on getting home. Exactly what Rusty would have been intent on, too, if he could have had a choice. So far as the world might know or care, he was headed straight for China. Hours later, when the fog had lifted, it unveiled an empty ocean, a familiar landmark called the Cliff House, and a strip of sandy shore lying below the Golden Gate. And suddenly, here came Rusty's little boat, right on time on the 12-hour cycle of the tides. He was headed for dry land, dead on and head on. Land at last. It was great to feel good old terra firma under his feet again. Now for cover. This openness was a little too much. Foxes like to be secretive. If he was going to take on San Francisco, he'd have to be the most secretive fox ever. In just about every big city, there's a patch of country that's home to more wildlife than you'll ever find in any remote wilderness area. San Francisco has just such a place, the famed Flyshacker Zoo. Some of its residents paid no attention to the footloose fox. This monkey business was their business, and Rusty soon had enough of it. The gibbon ape put on a much better act. By now, Rusty was hungry for food, not friendship. That was just as well, because he wasn't meeting anyone among the who's who of the zoo he'd want for a companion. Certainly not this big bearish brute, nor his odd roommate, even if he was a coyote, and a kind of a distant cousin.
Rusty was held spellbound by the strangest sight of all. What manner of monster was this? Rusty's nose said there must be something to eat around here somewhere. Maybe yes, maybe no. But in a place as unlikely as this, the prospects didn't look too good. Still, if a fella's hungry enough to eat an old glove, well, it figures he's pretty hungry. Of course, Rusty didn't do more than chew it up a bit, but it did sort of bring out the puppy in him. Hey, playtime, is it? Hey, man, wait for me. Rusty spotted this shirt-tailed relative and decided to avoid him. That started the game of hide and seek. Pop goes the red fox, and he went that away. friendly pup was beginning to be a nuisance. Anytime he wished, Rusty could have run away and hidden from the pestiferous pooch, but it was more sporting to tantalize him. The dog was tiring and losing interest in this one-sided game of trying to catch a will-o'-the-wisp. Finally, he gave up. Most unsociable dog he'd ever met. Meanwhile, Rusty got back to the more serious business of foraging for food. Whenever he could, he stuck to natural cover. And oddly enough, San Francisco supplies just such cover in its famous Golden Gate Park. There exists within the city, as it were, a kind of natural jungle. And right beside it, the concrete jungle of the city itself. Here was a sight to give a wild creature pause. How do you cope with this?
Rusty, for his part, figured he might have picked up a clue. He spotted at least one fellow who seemed to be making out. If this tightrope artist could get by in San Francisco, so might Rusty. But not by sitting here. He must be up and doing, doing whatever had to be done to get a long overdue meal. On fast and furty feet, the phantom fox roamed the sidewalks of San Francisco, seeing everything, but remaining unseen himself. In one way, Rusty was a typical tourist. He hit all the spots that are musts on a visitor's sightseeing list. One was the Palace of Fine Arts. The place itself didn't mean a thing to him, but its inhabitants did. They were real fox fare, delicacies. The catch was to catch them. Some were too big for him to tackle if he could. Anyway, the waterfowl, both big and little, stayed safely out of his reach. His best bet would be a pigeon. Rusty didn't improve his hunting technique, he'd never make it in the big town. A city is always on the move, hustling and bustling around the clock. It never really goes to sleep. But a young discouraged fox does, if only to forget his pangs of hunger. Rusty couldn't even get in a decent fox nap. There was always some nerve-shattering interruption. To get away from it all, Rusty took to San Francisco's famous hills. And now he found himself looking down on the busy waterfront known as the Embarcadero, an irresistible lure to all who visit the city. Rusty, it turned out, was to be no exception. A section of San Francisco's Embarcadero is known as Fisherman's Wharf. Naturally, Fisherman's Wharf puts out a powerful fragrance of fish. And that was the odor that lured Rusty to the scene. Then his sharp nose picked out a scent more powerful and enticing than the rest. It seemed to come from a particular warehouse. Any well-balanced meal should start with an appetizer. For a fox, the recipe for a crab cocktail has some complications. Rusty was getting nowhere fast when the stalemate was interrupted. If the famished fox couldn't conquer one crab, what could he do with a lot of them? Nothing. Unless he might get one off guard. Crabs, he learned, are masters of self-defense.
tough creatures indeed. Especially when you turn your back on them. The moral of the lesson was that crabs are best left alone. Rusty must find something that wouldn't put up such a fuss about being eaten. He spotted a possibility. The clams smelled good, and they didn't have pinchers. In fact, they looked quite defenseless without weapons of any kind. Most annoying, but still not painful. Though the clams couldn't bite back like the crab, they were just as well fortified. And now Rusty began thinking like a fox. There was more than one way to break a clam shell. His theory had been good, the execution perfect, and his luck still terrible. This just wasn't Rusty's day. At once, his luck changed. He'd had experience with fish before. They were good eating, and they neither pinched nor shot at him with water guns. Now, at last, it looked like he'd have the meal he'd been working for all this time. Oops, or did it? A waterfront brawl was brewing. A showdown was coming up. For a young and inexperienced fox, fighting a tough old tomcat was too big an order. Better to retreat quietly without further fuss. Rusty didn't look back. He'd had enough of Fisherman's War. He didn't slow down till he reached that colorful section of San Francisco known as Chinatown. He forgot his fear and began to forage. He didn't forget his caution though. He was still a ghost of a fox remaining hidden from human eyes. In the alley ahead, another hunter was about to close in on his prey. His strategy required much planning, plenty of patience, and lots and lots of strong strain. At the other end of it, perched the prize. The boy had no wish to harm the bird. All he wanted was to catch it and make a pet of it. he wanted was to make a meal of it.
This was more than the boy had hoped for. A dog such as he'd never seen before. Still, it looked sort of familiar, like a fox. In fact, he'd think it was a fox, except there weren't any foxes in San Francisco. No. Well, there was at least one, and it was his. Could Mr. Bring him back alive have this time? You know my hand, I see you. There's a fox in there. Ding on. Let me see. This the father would have to see. Hmm. Not likely, but not impossible. Identification confirmed. This was a matter for the Humane Society. It wouldn't be right to make a prisoner out of a wild animal. This was a disappointment to the boy, but he understood. He also understood from his father's end of the conversation that the fox needn't be turned over to the society till the following Monday. So Rusty got another ride, and the boy had a fox to care for. Not for keeps, but at least for a couple of days. And though Rusty didn't know it, he couldn't have been in better hands. he was used to the song of the city, the babble of human voices, the medley of traffic sounds. For a fox, he was quite the seasoned traveler. He'd been everywhere, seen everything, heard it all. Well, not quite all. What fox is ever prepared for a Chinese wedding? That night, Rusty, fox about town, was a guest at the Chan home, occupying a place of honor. And so far, he wasn't enjoying the occasion. Never had he seen or smelled such tempting tidbits. And as usual, they were out of reach. To a half-starved fox, eating is a poor spectator sport. If Rusty's hosts had known how hungry he was, how long it had been since his last meal, he might have been first served. As it was, there were other mouths to feed. Would nothing come his way, not even a scrap? Rusty's silent but eloquent plea was picked up by Mr. Chan. No one would ever leave his house hungry. Rusty's long fast was over. And the feast just began. To the Chinese, the highest compliment a guest can pay host and hostess during dinner is to eat heartily. 
Never had the chance entertain such a complimentary one as Rusty. Perhaps the honorable guest might like to sample something else. Such as sweet and sour. A bit of bacon. A piece of poultry. Rusty was ready for whatever was offered. The final course was shrimp. An animal as intelligent as a fox is quick to recognize a provider and benefactor. And Rusty sensed that the boy meant no harm. Though still a bit apprehensive being a wild creature, he would not bite the hand that had fed him. Come Monday morning, Rusty began his return trip to reality. First stop, the humane office. Rusty was booked for the ride of his life, a one-way passage out of the city. The traveler's next journey would be a modest conquest of space by helicopter. Each new adventure for the little vagabond was making Fox history, history unlikely to repeat itself. Fasten seat belts, please. So nice of you to do this, Ed. I had to help out. I'm going that way anyway. suspect he was talking to a fox who had really been places and done things. It won't be long now. To get over this bridge up here, you're on your way back to wherever you're going to. Finally, Rusty was flying over woods and grass and open spaces. 
helicopter flew, the more it looked like his kind of country, fox country. Suddenly, he saw something that made him sure it was. on his own. He seemed to know just where he was going and what he was doing. Rusty had some unfinished business to attend to. Fox business. 